Can you believe it? But this video is the 300th episode of Plainly Difficult. Thank you all for all of your support. And do you have any suggestions for a special episode? If you do, please let me know in the comments. It is the morning of the 27th of June 2009, and residents of Shanghai, People's Republic of China, are waking up to a bizarre sight. It is the construction of a new set of apartment blocks. Construction projects in China aren't particularly unique, but in the early hours, one of the new towers had collapsed. But not how you would think. It quite literally had fallen over, which would definitely be a bad day in the office. Welcome to Plainly Difficult. My name is John and today we're looking at the Lotus Riverside Collapse. Background. This is the Dingpu River in Minhang District, Shanghai, China. It, like many parts of the city, is experiencing a housing boom. Being the world's third largest city, the demand for living space breeds a market of quickly built developments. A new project is planned to overlook the river, and it is going to be called the Riverside Apartments. This is 11 13 storey high identical towers. Planning and site surveys for the area were undertaken during 2005 and 2006. Construction works began in 2007, and in the very Chinese standard of speediness, are expected to be completed and open for residents just two years later. The apartments are sold, as per mentioned in the Associated Press, at a cost of $2,100 per square metre. Each block has a mixture of two and three bedroom dwellings, aiming to offer nice views of the city for residents and a healthy profit for the developers. The company at the centre of the construction project is Shanghai Zhongjin Construction. The soil and the land, which has been chosen for the construction, was a mixture of silt and clay for around 30 or so metres, sat atop a fine sand. The Lotus apartments had hollow pre-stressed steel and cast concrete foundation piles with a diameter of roughly two feet. Each building had 114 piles, which ran through the layers of silt and clay into the fine sand with a length of 33 metres. The building's height was just under 40 metres at 13 storeys tall, and it was constructed using reinforced concrete. In the project, there were 11 of these towers, but for the rest of our story, we'll mainly be talking about Tower 7. By 2009, the tower blocks had largely been completed, at least externally. Internally, first and second fits were being undertaken. There was one pretty important part of the project left to be completed, however, and that was the underground parking areas. Strangely, the car parks were to be dug out after the towers had been constructed. Usually, you tend to see with these types of projects, the parking area is part of the main building's basement. However, instead here, the car park would be in front of Tower 7 by roughly 7 metres. This would require a depth dug out of 4.6 metres. This created a lot of earth that needed to be dumped somewhere. The location chosen was behind Tower 7 in front of the Dingpu River flood wall for use for landscaping later on. The area had been used earlier for the digging out of the basement of Tower 11 and had become the main dumping ground for loose dirt on site. Excavation began with the first 1.5 metres in January 2009. The excavated area's walls were strengthened with soil nails, but it was still exposed to the elements. Eventually, the waste soil would mount up to a height of over 10 metres to the north of Towers 6 and 7. More waste soil was eventually deposited at another stockpile site behind buildings 10 and 11, also near the temporary housing area for the project's workers. During the time the garage was being excavated and the pile mounted up, heavy rain soaked into the loose soil, weakening the ground around Tower 7. This created a reported lateral pressure of over 3,000 tonnes, which was far beyond what the concrete piles could withstand. Whilst we're on a China News vibe today, let me tell you about this story 
Biden planning on raising China tariffs on steel that I found on Ground News at ground.news slash plainly difficult. But what is Ground News, I hear you asking? Well, Ground News is a tool that can help cut through the confusing world that we live in, where we are subjected to the rapid spread of hard-to-verify information through social media, echo chambers created by algorithms and filter bubbles, and financially incentivized click-generating news sources. It does this by gathering related articles from more than 50,000 news sources around the globe. This allows you to see how the same story is reported at different outlets, and importantly, their political biases. Let's have a look at how it works. Take a look at this article. Biden targets China with new tariffs on steel and aluminium. It has been covered by 59 news articles and it is reported on the centre-right with right-leaning at 23% and left-leaning at 19%. If you scroll down, you can see every article about this topic and compare the headlines and importantly, the news outlet's factuality rating and where it falls on the political spectrum. If we look at this right-leaning article from ABS CBN, it focuses mainly on the USA. However, this left-leaning article from El Paris actually notes that Mexico is in on the proposed tariff increases. Although mainly in the centre, when using the bias distribution feature, you can see it's more centre-right. It works for me, as I'm always keeping up to date on world news. It's an important tool for thinking critically, and not just following one side of the political spectrum. What I really like is the blind spot feature that allows you to check for stories that you may not always see due to having strong political biases either way. I have the Vantage plan, and if it interests you, and I think you will, go to ground.news slash plainly difficult to give it a try. If you sign up through my link, you'll get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all features. I think Ground News is doing really important work, and I hope you'll check them out. Right, let's get on to the disaster. The disaster. Time to get out your bingo cards. It is the 26th of June 2009 and the flood wall behind buildings 10 and 11 fails. The flooding threatens the two towers. In an effort to try and protect them, workers are dispatched to flatten out the dirt pile behind the buildings from 6 metres to 1 metres high. The flooding also put at risk the temporary workers' housing shed. As such, four of the occupants who were working on Tower 7 were told to set up home in the basement of the tower. As the workers settled in for the night in the basement of Tower 7, they must have felt safe in comparison to the failed flood wall area around buildings 10 and 11. During the night, the site was subjected to five hours of heavy rainfall. The next morning, at around 5.30, the four workers sleeping in the basement of Tower 7 are woken up by a strange noise. The building was beginning to move. Three of the men escaped towards the north, but one ran towards the south. As the men escaped, Tower 7 fell almost whole towards the south, where the car parking garage had been dug out. The whole collapse had happened between 5 and 10 seconds. The tower landed in pretty much one piece, leaving just the snapped foundation piles sticking out of the sodden earth. Search of the structure found the body of migrant construction worker Zhao Ling, and he would be the only victim of the disaster. The Shanghai government appointed a 14-member strong investigation team, and the same day of the collapse, forensic investigation of the building began. Investigation the site would be poured over by investigators and pressure would come to the developers from the future owners of the apartment blocks. The development had around 620 apartments for sale, of which roughly 500 were sold. Understandably, the residents were concerned on the structural integrity of all the remaining towers. The Forensic Investigation Committee, after their initial check of the site, concluded that the flood wall near Building 7 was still secure. Tower 6 was found to have experienced some lateral movement, up to 2.5 centimetres, and due to this, the soil at Stockpile 1 was flattened and removed. The half dugout garage was also removed by being backfilled to prevent any more lateral movement of Tower 6. Nine people in charge of the development were held for questioning, as said in a statement from the Minhang District Propaganda Bureau reported by the NPR. They're being held in one place, helping with our inquiries. There's no proof of criminal activity, so we can't arrest them. 
During the investigation, it was found that cost savings were what created the 10 metre tall mud pile, saving the developer an estimated 5 to 6 million yuan by not moving the mud to another location, as said in ChinaDaily.com. But how did the building topple over? So the common explanation at the time was that the 10 metre tall waste soil pile combined with the excavation in front of Tower 7 caused a lateral load of over 3,000 tonnes, which was too much for the piles to handle. But interestingly, an American Society of Civil Engineers case study would posit a slightly different theory. This suggested that the ground below the dirt mound had an undrained general shear failure, i.e. the water that had seeped into the soil from the rainfall and the subgrade soil had lost its strength with the dump soil above it. This caused the soil to slide, which caused enough of a force to overturn the tower, which in doing so snapped the building's piles. But if the previously accepted failure theory was right, then the building should have fallen towards the north, not to the south as it did. It's a very compelling argument. The report also uses the same argument for the failure of the flood wall behind Tower 11 the day before Tower 7's collapse. But I'm no geotechnical engineer, and I'm sure many of you will be screaming at your phones or iPad or laptop screens saying how wrong I am. If so, I do apologise. Now, I have put the link for this report in the pinned comment, so it's well worth checking out. But regardless of the mechanics of the failure, the collapse was a direct cause of corner cutting and cost saving. You know those nine people held but not arrested? Well, eight of them would be unnot arrested and charged. Two of whom would be charged with embezzling company funds and negligence, as reported in China Daily. The two top shareholders of a real estate firm responsible for developing the Lotus Riverside residential complex, where a nearly complete building fell to its side last year, were sentenced to life in prison on Wednesday. Additionally, Zhang had allowed an unqualified contractor to build the underground car garage in November 2008. Ouch. On top of that, six others were sentenced to between two and five years for their part in the building's demise. The disaster is just another prime example of a tofu building in China. If you have any more suggestions, please let me know in the comments. And that's got me thinking about tasty, tasty tofu. So it's scale time. It's going to be a two, but as a balls up, it's got to be much higher. And this is what I've got for the old bingo card. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike Licensed. Plain Difficult videos produced by me, John, in the very, very warm corner of Southern London, UK. I have a second YouTube channel, an Instagram and Twitter, or X, or someone also called it Zeta, which sounded quite interesting. Um, so check them all out for my extra odds and sods and bits and pieces I get up to. I'd like to say a very, very warm thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members for your financial support, as well as the rest of you every week for tuning in to watch my videos. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching, and Mr Music, please play out the video.